Okay, I'll get started. I hope you can hear me okay. So last cast, we introduced the notion or the concept of pressure in fluids. And we also introduced an equation or a formula describing the pressure in fluids. Uh, a lot of today's class is really gonna be about applying the notions of pressure and equations for pressure in fluids to some you know, interesting examples, important examples. So uh, for example, we'll talk about why it is that boats float. Um, that's a topic in hydrostatics, fluids at rest, and it's an example of what we call Archimedes principle. And we'll talk about um, how planes fly. Uh, and that's an example of what we call hydrodynamics or fluids in motion. And it will introduce what we call Bernoulli's principle. And we'll look at a you know, few other examples involving, few other illustrations involving pressure, pressure topics. So just as a bit of background, um, today's class is built on two important principles about fluids, like the atmosphere, like the ocean or other fluids. Um, one is more than 2000 years old and it comes from that philosopher, you know his name, right? Archimedes. Um, and it's called Archimedes principle and it's about it, it's about fluids at rest. It's about hydrostatics. And the second, the second idea about fluids that we'll be talking about today is from a scientist that was at the um, sort of time of the Enlightenment or Renaissance. Um, and that's uh, Bernoulli. Um, and uh, his work was on hydrodynamics as fluids in motion, and we're going to be talking about Bernoulli's principle. Okay, so let's start with Archimedes principle. And first I want to just show you a little demonstration, which is, you know, kind of a demonstration of an obvious thing that, you know, you, you know already, um, but let's do it anyway. It's that some objects float and some objects sink in, for example, water, in the ocean, or in a river. So let me just show you a quick demonstration here. I'm gonna share a different screen. And uh, what you're gonna see in this no expense spared video production um, is, my hand placing different objects into a, a, a flask of water. And we're gonna see these different objects float and sink. And so I think this first object is a wooden object. It was a piece of pine, I believe, which is a relatively um, light wood. And uh, it floats. So why does it float? So that's an interesting question. And then I came along, I had to go down to the department safe for this one. This is a, a cube of gold, and I'm gonna drop that cube of gold uh, into the tank of water. And let's see what happens there. And of course that object sinks, and there it is right at the bottom. So why did the gold sink? That's an interesting question. So we've got one object floating, the wood, one object sinking the gold. I've got another piece of wood here. This was a piece of um, balsa, which is a very light wood. And I'm just gonna drop that in. And that really floats right at the top there. And then finally, I've got a cube of steel that we also had in the department. 
and I'm going to drop that cube of steel in the uh, water. Here it is. It's actually got painted black. I don't know why. Um, but we're going to drop that in the water and see whether that floats or sinks. Of course, you know the answer to this. It sinks. So why did the two wooden objects float? And why did the gold and the steel sink? We're going to try and answer those questions. So let me go back to my slides. And as I say, over there on the left-hand side, there's my flask of water, there's my wood floating in it, my um, steel sunk in it. Why is that? Um, we could do the same thing with, um, with another fluid, air. That's on the right-hand side. Uh, so over here on the uh, right is, is air. And I've got in this tank of air, I'm gonna get my um, uh, pen going again here. I've got a helium balloon and that's floating in the air and I've got a water balloon and that's sunk to the ground in the air. And so the helium balloon and the water are examples like the, the wood and the steel. Why, why does one float and why, why does one sink? Um, is it that you know, lighter objects float and heavier objects sink. You know, the, the wood was lighter than the steel and the helium balloon is lighter than the water. So is it that it's a matter of whether the object is heavy or light? The answer is no, it's not simply a matter of whether the object is heavy or light. Um, we could get a light piece of steel and a heavy piece of wood and we'd still find that the heavy wood would float and the light steel would sink. We could get a huge heavy helium balloon and a small light water balloon. And we still find that the heavy helium balloon would float and the, um, the small wood water balloon would sink. The key thing is not the weight or not the mass, um, not the fact that one's light and one's heavy, but the density. And so what we're going to discover is that it's less dense objects that will float, less dense than the fluid they're immersed in. And it's more dense objects that will sink, more dense than the fluid that they're floating in. So when we're looking at over here on the left, which objects float and sink in water, the sinking or floating is really a comparison of their densities to the density of the fluid, the water. When we're looking over here on the right and we're looking at what objects float and sink in air, it's really whether they float or sink in air is determined by their, their density relative to the density of the fluid, the air. Okay, so the key to flow in and sinking is what we call, actually what we met in the last class is the buoyant force. And I'm gonna give that the symbol F for force, subscript B for, for buoyant or buoyancy. Uh, so the buoyant force is a, is a category of force that appears when you have an object in a fluid. So it would be absent if we had the wood block, the steel block, the helium balloon, the water balloon in outer space in vacuum. But it's present when we have the wood block and the steel block in the water, that's a fluid. It's present when we have the helium balloon, the, the water balloon in air, that's a, that's a fluid too. And so, Here's the picture from the last slide of the floating wood and sunken steel blocks and the floating helium balloon and the um, sunken water balloon. And what I've added to this picture is for the sunken and floating objects, the relationships between 
uh, their weights, so the forces of gravity acting on them, which is pulling them downwards towards the center of the earth, and the buoyant forces that are acting on them, which arises because they're, they're in a fluid, they're placed in a fluid, which generates a, produces a buoyant force. When the objects float, so that's, let's see, the wooden object is floating, it's over here on the left, the helium balloon is floating over here on the right. When they're floating, what that means is that the, the force of gravity downwards is being balanced by a buoyant force upwards. So floating objects, the floating helium balloon, the floating wooden block, have a um, buoyant force that's able to counteract the gravitational force. The buoyant force push upwards is exactly balancing the gravitational pull downwards. When an object sinks, that's the steel block in the water balloon at the bottom of the water or the bottom of the atmosphere. In that case, the buoyant force is unable, it's not sufficiently large, it's not sufficiently big to support the, um, support the steel block, so to support the uh, water balloon. The buoyant force isn't large enough to counteract the gravitational forces on the steel block or the water balloon. And so that's a, that's a key to understanding uh, why things float and why things sink. It's due to the size of the buoyant force. Now, um, as I say, the key thing is for the wood and the helium balloon, the buoyant force is sufficient to support the objects. And for the steel and the water balloon, the buoyant force is insufficient to support the object. And so that's to introduce that the key to floating sinking is the buoyant force. But the next question is obviously, well, how do we know how big or small the buoyant force is on the wood, the steel, the helium balloon, the water balloon? So let's go on and answer that. And that's actually Archimedes' principle. So Archimedes' principle is a, a really nice and simple and straightforward statement. It says that the size of the buoyant force is equal to the amount of the fluid, it might be the water, it might be the air, that got displaced when you place the, the object in the fluid. So when we place the wooden block or the steel block in the water, we're displacing, we're having to push some water out of the way, and it's the weight of water that was displaced that's equal to the strength, the size of the buoyant force. When you put the helium balloon and the water balloon in the air, that's a fluid. It's the, um, the buoyant force is equal to the weight of that air that got pushed away, displaced, when we put the helium balloon and the water balloon in the air. And so um, here's an example of that for the case of the, the wooden block and the steel block. Um, now I've got the steel block over here on the left hand side and I've placed it in the water and it's sunk. And the steel block has displaced some volume of water corresponding to its volume. I'm, I'm enjoying myself just sort of drawing that right now. Um, and that that volume of water has some weight, has some mass, has some weight, and that's the size of the buoyant force. So this buoyant force here, that's trying to support the steel block, is equal to the weight of water that got displaced. And the same is true when we place the, um, the wood block into the water. It has displaced some fluid. It's this amount of fluid here. Again, I'm kind of enjoying sketching this in. And uh, Archimedes' principle, that, that that amount of fluid that was pushed out of the way, that was displaced, uh, its weight is equal to the buoyant force. So uh, this buoyant force here is equal to the weight of that water displaced. 
Um, now you notice that actually a difference between the floating situation on the right and the um, uh, sunken situation on the left, so the wooden block and the steel block, is that the steel block has displaced its entire volume of water, whereas the wooden block only displaced a fraction of its volume of water. And that's the difference between sinking and floating. If something sinks beneath the surface of the water, the amount of water displaced is the entire volume of the object. If something floats on the top of the water, the amount of water displaced is a fraction, a portion of the volume of the object. So this principle, Archimedes' principle, that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of water displaced, applies whether or not the object has sunk or the object floats. So that principle is due for both the wooden and the steel blocks. That's important. It's, it's a principle that applies whether the object is fully submerged like the steel block or just partially submerged like the um, wooden block. An important difference though is, as I say, when the steel block sunk, it displaced its entire volume. When the wooden block floated, it displaced a fraction of its volume. So that is a difference. Okay, so that's Archimedes' principle. That's the rule for computing the um, the buoyant force. And um, uh, we could go on and we're going to go on and, and work examples using that rule. But I did want to give you just a little explanation of where the rule comes from because um, uh, it's interesting to understand where the rule comes from. And the, the rule comes from our notions, our understanding actually of pressure from last class. So take a look at this picture here. This is an object that's fully submerged in a tank of water. So um, in blue, we've got the uh, fluid or the water. In uh, orange, we got the object inside the tank of water. Um, it's some sort of cylinder. And um, what I'm gonna do is think about the object. Now I'm gonna think about the um, forces and the pressures on the object from the fluid that's surrounding the object. And I'm going to think about it in a rather quantitative way, in a rather precise way. Um, so firstly, um, let me introduce a few quantities here. The object has a area, cross-sectional area A, so that's that cylindrical circular face upstairs here and down below here and it has a vertical height h. So it's a cylinder of area A and height h. Now, that means that um, it has a volume, the volume of that cylinder, I'll just write it over here, is gonna be, in cubic meters, is gonna be its cross-sectional area A times its height h cross-sectional in area meters squared, height in meters. So, th so that's the volume. So that's the object that we placed in. And then we've got a, a fluid. And um, the characteristic of the fluid is the density of the fluid. And here's the density of the fluid, and we give that the symbol rho. Now, what we're gonna be interested in is this Archimedes rule for the buoyant force, which says it's determined by the mass or the weight of the fluid displaced. So we want to know the mass or the weight of the fluid displaced. So over here on the, um, the right-hand side, I, I'm writing down an equation for the mass of the fluid displaced by this object. And I'm writing it down by first starting from the volume of fluid that's displaced by the object. So the object is underwater. It's beneath the surface of the water. It, it's submerged beneath the water. So that means the volume of the fluid, I put in subscript F on the volume of the fluid, is gonna be the same as the volume of, the, of the, the solid, the cylinder. 
And then that means that the mass of the fluid, that's going to be the um, volume of the fluid times the density of the fluid. And so there's the mass of the fluid. And, you know, if we wanted the weight of the fluid, here's the weight of the fluid, it would just be the acceleration of gravity times the mass of the fluid. So it would literally be rho, the density of the fluid, times the uh, volume of the fluid, times the acceleration of gravity. And this equation here, or the weight of fluid that we displaced, uh, that we've got from this equation over here, from the volume of the object we put in the fluid, we're going to use that. We're going to use that to derive the buoyant force. Okay. So here's my der derivation. I, I mean, I, I know that like derivation is like a, a bad word in, in, in physics 211, 213, um, but sometimes we have to do a derivation. Here I'm going to do a little derivation. I'm going to, I'm going to derive this relationship that we've just talked about between um, the buoyant force. That's going to be over here on this side. Gosh, why did I do that? I'm going to derive this relationship between the, um, the buoyant force over here on the left-hand side and the weight of fluid displaced over here on the right-hand side. So this, this is a der derivation. This is the connection that Archimedes laid down between buoyant force and weight of fluid. Okay, so to, to follow the derivation, just take a look at what I also added to the picture. I said that the, um, the object in the fluid is being pushed down by a force from the fluid that's governed by the, the pressure exerted by the fluid at that location in the fluid. And likewise, on the bottom face, the object is being pushed up by the fluid and that force upwards on the fluid is um, uh, determined by the pressure of the fluid at that, that, that location in the fluid. And so we're going to derive Archimedes' principle by recognizing that this buoyant force arises, it rises from the difference between the upwards and downwards pushes of the fluid above and below the object's surface, and that difference between the pushes downwards and upwards from the fluid above and below the object is determined by the, the pressure in the fluid above, directly above and directly below the fluid. And so that's the first step here. So this buoyant force is because this force upwards, I labeled it F2, is a little bit bigger than this force downwards, I labeled it F1. And it's that difference that's the buoyant force. And these two forces, F1 and F2, on the bottom and top faces are determined by the pressures at, um, in the fluid at the top and bottom faces. And the pressures are related to the forces by force equals pressure times area. And so I just fed in that relationship. I, here it is. And then I noted that that pressure difference, that's due to the depth in the fluid the different depths in the fluid at the top face and the bottom face. And that's determined by this little equation here. As you go deeper in a fluid, the pressure grows. Here's the increase in pressure in the fluid as we walk down from the top face to the bottom face. It goes as rho gh. We met this in last class when we were describing pressure. So I filled that in. I replaced the pressure difference with, with rho gh. Here we are. And then I observed, look, this is great. This, this product of density, acceleration of gravity, height and area, is nothing other than the weight of fluid, the weight of water, say, that I've displaced. And so this guy here is nothing other than the weight. And so 
that you know that little derivation to me the way i think of it is it's like a little story like a little physics bedtime story it walks us through from a concept of a buoyant force lifting up the object when it's immersed in a fluid to the origins of the buoyant force in the pressure, the pressure differential between the top and bottom faces of the object in the fluid, to an equation for the buoyant force in terms of the amount of water that we displace when we place the object in the fluid. And so it's, um, yeah, on, on one hand, it's, yeah, it's a physics derivation. On the other hand, I think it's a kind of a nice little story of our understanding of buoyancy and Archimedes principle. Okay. Let me make one more remark about where that law comes from. The ultimate origins of Archimedes principle and the buoyancy of the object it comes from, we saw that pressure comes from at the microscopic level, at the atomic molecular level. It comes from the fact that atoms and molecules are colliding with the, um, the surface or the object that's in the fluid. And so when we immerse the steel or the wooden block inside the fluid, the atoms and molecules of the fluid, here you see a few of them, I sketched them out. They're they're bouncing off that object. They're colliding with that object. Every time they collide or bounce off that object, they transfer a, a little momentum. They give a little force. And so that's what's going on. Um, if we could really picture that microscopic level of the atoms and molecules of the fluid, we'd see that that, that buoyant force is really just this superposition of all these tiny, tiny, tiny microscopic forces from all these tiny, tiny microscopic collisions. And that adds up, that sums up to create the buoyant force. Now, the buoyant force is an upwards force because if you were to look inside the fluid and watch the atoms and molecules moving around inside the fluid, you find it a very interesting thing. Near the top of the fluid, their motion is a little slower. The collisions are a little softer. Near the bottom of the fluid, their motions are a little faster. Their collisions are a little more furious. And it's that difference that's actually a consequence of the pressure difference. And it's that difference that causes the upward buoyant force, that the collisions on the top surface are a little bit weaker, collisions on the bottom surface a little bit stronger. Okay, well, that was fun. Let's move on to some illustrations. Let's move on to some examples of Archimedes' principle. And Here's a, actually a, an interesting one, and um, it's actually kind of a useful one. And um, if you ever want to know your density, and sometimes you do want to know your density because I might want to know, well, am I just, you know, uh, bone or am I, you know, bone and muscle, or am I, how much fat am I? If you want to know the composition of your body, you want to measure your density. And this is sort of how you do it. In this case, we're going to, we're going to lower a object, not me, but a crown that I got from a junk shop um, or a secondhand shop. And, and I, I'm wondering if this crown is really gold. And so how would I know if this crown is really gold? I would have to know the density of the crown. And we can use Archimedes' principle to figure out the density of the crown. I'm going to show you how I do it. Um, so here's the crown. And of course, it's a shape where I can't really just weigh it, calculate its volume, and divide its mass by its volume to determine the density. The shape's too difficult to determine the volume. Rather, what I'm actually going to do, firstly, I'm going to weigh it with these scales um, outside this tank of water. That I'm going to call the true weight of the object. I'm just going to hang the crown from the scales and measure its true weight. Mm -hmm. And then I'm going to place the object in the tank of water and measure its apparent weight in the tank of water. 
And that's what I did. And what I found is two numbers here. These are going to be important for us. Oops. The true weight. So that remember that the true weight is when the crown isn't in the tank of water. Uh, that was 7.84 newtons. The apparent weight. Remember, the apparent weight is when the crown is in the tank of water. That was 6.86 newtons. And from those two, two weights, the true weight, the apparent weight, I'm going to figure out the crown's density. And if I know the crown's density, I compare it with the density of gold. I know whether I've got a gold crown or a fake crown. Okay, so on this slide, before I do any calculations, I just wanted to sketch out the forces in these two situations. So over here on the left, I'm measuring the true weight with my set of scales. So my scales are up here. And um, when you measure the true weight with the scales, this is what you're doing. You've got the object, this is the crown, it's being pulled down by the force of gravity. That's its weight. And you're supporting it with the scales. And the force on the scales is the tension in the scales. And what we do is we read the tension in the scales. Here it is. And we say that that must be equal and opposite to the weight. That's how we measure the weight. We measure the tension and infer the weight. That's the true weight. Now, what happens when we... Um, measure the weight, the apparent weight of the crown when it's immersed in the fluid. That's this situation on the right hand side here. So again, here are scales and I'm now measuring the weight with the scales. And this is the same idea, right? The object is pulled down by the force of gravity. That's not changed. We're measuring a tension in the scales which is what we're using to infer the weight. Now it's a little bit less. And it's a little bit less because there's actually an extra force here. It's the buoyant force. It's the buoyant force because we've immersed the crown in water. And so if we first measured the true weight, so here is the, the, the true weight, this guy here. 7.84 newtons. Then we measure the apparent weight. It's this guy here. I called it T prime. It's 6.86 newtons. The difference between those two, the true weight and the um, apparent weight, that, that, that force is the buoyant force. And so by drawing these two pictures and me measuring the true weight, measuring the apparent weight, I'm able to conclude, right, that the buoyant force must be equal to the difference between the true weight and the apparent weight. It's 1.02 newtons. And so that's an important thing um, that we've just figured out from thinking about the forces acting when I'm measuring the true weight, the forces acting when I'm measuring the apparent weight is that I can figure out what the buoyant force was when we immersed the crown in water. And, and we're gonna actually figure the density of the, um, the crown um, by understanding that we've just determined uh, the, the buoyant force on the crown. Okay, so now I'm gonna go on to the calculations. So uh, upstairs here, I'm just reproducing the sketches from the last slide so that we have them. And most importantly, they gave us the buoyant force here. Okay, so <clears throat> we want the density of the crown. I wanna know whether I just found a gold crown in the junk shop, or it's just a fake crown that I found in the junk shop. To find the density of the crown, well, what is density? It's mass over volume. I'm going to need the mass and the volume of the crown. So first, I'm going to figure out the mass of the crown. 
Second, I'm going to figure out the volume of the crown. And then from density being mass over volume, I'll just figure out the, um, uh, the density of the, of the crown. So let's do that. Uh, mass of the crown is easy, right? We know the weight of the crown. Uh, we know the acceleration of gravity. So the mass of the crown is the weight of the crown divided by the acceleration of gravity. It's this number here, point, point 0.8 kilograms. What about the volume of the crown? Well, that's where I'm going to use Archimedes' principle. Archimedes' principle says that the buoyant force on the crown, which is 1.02 newtons, is equal to the weight of water displaced. The weight of water displaced is the mass of water times the acceleration of gravity. The mass of water is the density of water times the volume of water. The volume of water that we've displaced is the volume of the crown. And so Archimedes' principle leads us from something we know over here, the buoyant force, to something that we want, the volume of the crown. This is how we're getting in the volume of the crown. See, I know the buoyant force. I know the density of water, and I know the acceleration of gravity. The only thing I don't know here is the volume of the crown. So that's like magic. So I can rearrange that equation. And it tells me that if I want to figure out the volume of the crown, all I got to do is take the buoyant force, which was the difference between the true and apparent weights, divided by the density of water, divided by the um, acceleration of gravity. And so that's what I've done here. Here's the buoyant force upstairs. Here's the density of water. Here's the acceleration of gravity. This is the volume of the crown. Well, now I'm almost there. I've got I've solved the mass, I've solved the volume. Now I can go down to the density. Density is mass over volume. Density of the crown is mass of the crown over the volume of the crown. The mass of the crown is eight kilograms. The volume of the crown is 1.04 times 10 to the minus four cubic meters. I get a density that's 8,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Now that's quite a high density. It's much higher than the water density. It's eight times higher than the water density. Um, but it's not the density of gold, sadly. The density of gold is amazingly large. It's 19,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And so, unluckily, the crown from the junk shop was not a real crown, a real gold, but a fake crown of fake gold. Okay, I think time's up on the quiz. So, um, we're told that Ice floats in water. We know ice floats in water. And ice actually sinks in pure alcohol. Um, whether something floats, whether something sinks in a fluid is basically a comparison of the density of that object, here the ice, to the fluid, here water or alcohol. So an object will float if its density is less than the fluids. An object will sink if its density is greater than the fluid. So if ice floats in water, it's denser than water. If ice sinks in alcohol, then, sorry, if ice floats in water, it's less dense than water. If ice sinks in alcohol, it's more dense than alcohol. Okay, related question. So here's an iceberg, um, and um, the question is, what fraction of the iceberg is underwater? Can we calculate what fraction of the iceberg is underwater? And the way we're going to calculate what fraction of the iceberg is underwater is um, from the densities of ice compared to water. Now, as we said in the last um, quiz, uh, ice floats in water. And so it is less dense than water. And here this ice has a density of 917 kilograms per cubic meter, whereas water is a little bit higher density, it's 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. And those two densities are enough to find which fra what fraction of the ice is submerged. So let's try and do that. 
And so here's the calculation. Actually, here's a diagram of the forces, what's going on from a force perspective. And um, also, also the calculation, what's going on from the calculation perspective. So upstairs, uh, in blue, here's the water. And in white, here's the ice. And the ice is floating in the water. What does that mean from a force perspective? The ice is floating in the water. It's sitting there at rest in the water and it's staying at rest in the water. It's an equilibrium in the water. The net force on the ice is zero. That means that the downward force of gravity on the ice, the weight of the ice, must be balanced exactly by the upwards buoyant force on the ice. So that's what's happening from force perspective. When something's floating, there's this perfect, beautiful balance of buoyant force, gravitational force, to make a zero net force. So that's gonna be our starting point when we now wanna calculate the fraction of ice that submerge. Now, when I'm gonna calculate the fraction of ice submerge, what that means is, what I'm calculating is the ratios of the water that got displaced, the volume of water that got displaced, that's this region of water here. That got pushed out of the way. That got pushed to the left and the right and the front and the back as the ice dropped in that hole. We're gonna calculate that volume divided by the, vol the entire volume of ice. So that is a fraction. That, that ratio of those two volumes is a fraction. It's just a number and it says the uh, fraction of ice that's underwater. And that's what we want to calculate. And we're going to calculate it by Archimedes' principle and our picture of the buoyant forces and weight of the ice being in equilibrium. And that's encompassed, sort of, that's embodied by this little equation here. So because we got equilibrium with the ice is floating in the water, the weight of the ice is equal to the buoyant force, which is equal to the weight of water displaced. Now the weight of water displaced, the weight of water displaced is equal to the mass of water times the acceleration of water. Uh, the mass of ice it, sorry, the weight of ice is equal to the mass of ice times the acceleration of gravity. So if the weights of the displaced water and the weights of the displaced ice are the, are the same, then we can cancel out these Gs and it must mean that the mass of the ice and the mass of the displaced water are the same. And if I then just write mass in terms of density and volume, I get this little equation here. So the product of the ice's density and its volume and the water's density and its volume are, must be equal to one another. Well, we want the ratio of the water's volume, the displaced water's volume to the ice's volume. So I can rearrange this equation for that ratio. And it tells me that ratio of the water's volume to the ice's volume, which is the fraction of the iceberg that's underwater, is determined by the ratio of the ice's density to the water's density. I know the ice's density, I know the water's density, I can plug them in and this is the fraction. 92% of the iceberg is underwater. Only 8% of the iceberg is above water. So you see this, you see this iceberg, it's an amazing picture, but it's not like it's just floating right on the surface here. There's 92% of that iceberg. There's most of that iceberg that's lurking underwater. That's why we, we didn't want to be on the Titanic when it hit an iceberg. It hit the bit that was under underwater most likely. Okay. I want to go on to Bernoulli's equation, but I want to show you uh, a little demo that I forgot to show you before we go on. And that is a demonstration of this um, apparent weight and true weight uh, for an object and how we were able to measure the density of the object 
from the apparent weight and true weight. So let me just show you this, this demonstration. So I don't have my crown that I want to test, but I do have a rock. And look, that rock weighs 14 newtons. That's, that, that scale is measuring the uh, rock's weight in newtons by measuring the tension in the string there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop it in this tank of water and measure the apparent weight in the tank of water. And now it's just uh, it's about 9 newtons. So there's an example. We measured the true weight of the rock. 14 newtons. 14 newtons. We measure the apparent weight of the rock, nine nine newtons. So the um, buoyant force on the rock from the water there was the difference between those. It was uh, five newtons. And then we could use that buoyant force to figure out the um, the the volume of the rock, and then calculate the density of the rock. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my slides now. <clears throat> and I'm gonna talk about Bernoulli's equation and we're gonna look at um, an ex illustration of Bernoulli's equation. So let me just say a first, a few, few words about the, the context of Bernoulli's equation. It's about uh, fluids in motion. It's about flow of fluids. Um, but there's actually two categories of fluids in motion. There's two categories of um, uh, the flow of fluids. Uh, one is called turbulent flow, and one is called uh, laminar flow. And they're, they're pictured on this uh, overhead here. So upstairs here is a turbulent flow, and downstairs here this is a laminar flow. And in turbulent flow, as you, as you can see from the picture, um, the, the, the fluid flows kind of um, in a um, sort of curling and rotating motion as it flows down a pipe. Whereas in laminar flow, the fluid flows in these sort of straight line streams as it flows down the pipe. And so there's these two basic categories of, um, of flow. And um, Bernoulli's equation, uh, Bernoulli's equation will, I didn't mean to do that. Bernoulli's equation applies to this laminar flow downstairs here. So it applies to this situation. Uh, it doesn't apply to this turbulent flow upstairs here, that situation. Okay, so why have I put this uh, picture of this supermodel inside the lecture slides? That's an interesting question. Here's why. Here's an example of streamline flow, laminar flow, and here's an example of turbulent flow. And so Bernoulli's equation would apply um, to a flow of a fluid that looks like this type of motion upstairs here, um, but it, it doesn't apply to this, um, this type of motion over here. So those are the realms of Bernoulli's equations. Okay, so um, Bernoulli's equation tells us actually how pressure in the fluid changes with speed in the fluid. And I'm not going to derive Bernoulli's equation. We derived uh, Archimedes' principle. I'm not going to derive Bernoulli's equation and Bernoulli's principle. I'm going to quote it, but we are going to talk about it. So imagine this situation here. So we've got a pipe that's shown in blue. And over here on the left-hand side of the pipe, the 
cross section of the pipe is large. So it's a large wide pipe on the left. Over here on the right hand side, the cross section of the pipe is smaller. It's a more narrow pipe. So fluid is flowing in from the left into the large diameter part of the pipe and out on the right through the small diameter part on the pipe. Now, imagine you've got a fluid, a type of fluid that we call a non-compressible fluid. Now, water is a non-compressible fluid. Actually, air is not really a non-compressible fluid. Um, but for our examples, we're going to think about water as a, it is truly a non-compressible fluid, and we're going to approximate air as a, a non-compressible fluid. If the fluid is non-compressible, that means that where the pipe is wide, the fluid's going to be traveling slower than where the pipe is, where the pipe is narrow. It's going to have to travel faster where the pipe is narrow. Imagine, imagine this case on a, um, a roadway, right, where you had multiple lanes over here on the left-hand side and just one lane over here on the right-hand side. If the fluid's not going to pile up, where the road gets narrow, or the cars are not going to pile up where the road gets narrow. The cars are going to have to approach the narrowing slowly and then travel after the narrowing much more quickly. And you know this is the case, right? If you're ever on, you know, I-75 or whatever and there's roadworks, you're where, where the number of lanes is going from three to one, right? Approaching where the number of lanes go to three from three to one, uh, you're moving painfully slowly. But as soon as you get through that narrowing from three lanes to one lane, suddenly you're flying again. And so, you know, this principle of the change in speed for an incompressible fluid actually applies for the change of speed of the incompressible cars on a freeway that they will travel faster in that narrow section, slower in that wide section. Okay, so we know now that um, over here on the left, we've got three lanes or a large cross-sectional area of the pipe. Over here on the right, we got one lane or a small cross-sectional area of the pipe. And over here on the left, the, the speed is correspondingly low and over here on the right is speed is correspondingly high. And I called the area of the pipe and the speed of the pipe A1, V1 on the left, area of the pipe A2, V2 on the right. And what we're interested in is the pressure in the fluid over here on the left and the right, what I'm going to call P1 and P2. How are those two pressures related? Well, that's what Bernoulli's equation describes. Here's the equation. It looks a little bit of a mouthful. But in some sense, it's not too much of a mouthful when you know the right way to look at it. So look, inside this equation is the answer to our question. Here's the pressure in the large diameter pipe. Here's the pressure in the small diameter pipe. They're the P1s and the P2s. The other pieces in this equation are determined by the speed that the fluid is traveling down the pipe. Here's the speed in the um, wide section of the pipe V1. Here's the speed in the uh, narrow section of the pipe V2. And what this equation is telling you, if you look at it, where the speed is low, so over here the speed is, is small, that means that this term must be small the one half row V one squared must be small. That must mean that the pressure is higher because over here on the right, well here the V two is large, which means that this second term is large, which means that this pressure P two must be smaller than P one. So when the term with the speed is small, the pressure must be large. When the term with the speed is large, the pressure is going to be smaller. This is telling us that in the slower fluid region, the 
pressure in the fluid is higher. In the faster fluid region, the pressure is lower. And that's Bernoulli's principle, that the pressure goes down as the speed goes up, or the, or the pressure goes up as the speed goes down. As I say, I'm not gonna derive that relationship between pressure and speed, but I'll give you a little argument uh, to kind of at least explain that relationship between pressure and speed. So we, we argue that the, that the fluid must speed up as it goes from left to right, just like the cars will speed up as they go from the um, three lanes open to the one lane open section on the highway. So the, the, the fluid is sped up. Gosh, if I do that one more time. The, the fluid is sped up in this region of the constriction. But what do you have to do to speed something up? We actually know what you have to do to speed something up. You have to do work on that something. So we've got to do work on the fluid to speed it up which means that we've got to exert a net force on the fluid to speed it up. So what's happening in this region of the constriction is some work is being done on the fluid. What's happening in that region of the constriction is that there's a net force being exerted on the fluid. And so that's the first thing to realize. This, this region here is a really interesting region because there is work being done on the fluid and there is a net force being exerted on the fluid. And so where does that work being done on the fluid, where does that net force being exerted on the fluid come from? It comes from the fluid itself. If the pressure in region number one, that's on the left, is bigger than the pressure in region number two, that's on the right, that means that Take a slice of fluid in this region where the lanes are going from three to one. There's a pressure on the left, there's a pressure on the right. There's a force on the left. There's a force on the right. If the pressure is larger on the left, the force is larger on the left. If the pressure is smaller on the right, the force is smaller on the right. So this, there is a net force here because there's a pressure difference here. And so that pressure difference between the pipe that had the large diameter and the pipe region that had the small narrow diameter, that pressure difference is what exerts the force, is what speeds up the fluid by doing work on the fluid. And so um, this is not a derivation of the equation, but is definitely an explanation of the equation. Let me show you a demonstration of this. <clears throat> I'm going to share another screen. So I've got a um, air here. Let me. Oh, I didn't mean to do that and go to quizzes. I've got an air hose. You can see the air hose in yellow here. And I've got a pipe upstairs here. And this pipe has a wide section that's here. It has a narrow section that's in here. And then it has a sort of intermediate diameter section here. So it's a little hard to see, but this, this first piece where this downwards, first downwards pipe is located is the largest diameter. This piece here, second piece is where the second downward pipe is, that's the smallest diameter. And then this, this third piece here, this is an intermediate diameter. Now, if I pass air from the left to the right, that air is passing through the pipe. Where it's going slow, the pressure will be large. 
Where it's going fast, the pressure will be small. Where it's going intermediate speed, in the intermediate diameter pipe, the pressure will be intermediate. If the pressure is large here, then this green fluid will get pushed down a lot. If the pressure is smaller in the middle here, the green fluid will get pushed down less. And in this pipe over here on the far right, if the pressure is intermediate, the, the green fluid will be pushed down an intermediate amount. So let's see what happens when I... So on the left, the pressure's higher, the green fluid's pushed down a lot. In the middle, the, the pressure's in a meet is smallest, and so the fluid's pressed down the least. And so that's Bernoulli's principle. Let me go back to my slides. This is actually what we call full-blown Bernoulli's equation and full-blown Bernoulli's principle. In the illustration with the pipe and in the um, uh, equation that we quoted for Bernoulli's equation, the, the pipe changed diameter, but it was at the same height everywhere. If the diameter of the if the height of the pipe changes, and that's what you see in here, not only does the, um, if you look at this pipe, as the fluid is flowing down this pipe here, now I've got to get my pen working again. So the fluid is flowing from left to right down this pipe here. Not only does the diameter change, but also, you know, the height to the center of the pipe changes. In that case, this is the equation that describes the change in pressure. So the pressure can change not only because of the change in speed of the fluid down the pipe, but the pressure can also change because of the change in height of the pipe. This is really putting together the stuff we just learned about pressure change with speed from this class and the stuff we previously learned with pressure change with height from uh, Tuesday's class. So this equation describes these two facts. This is the understanding, the comprehension behind this equation. Slower fluid, that means higher pressure. Faster fluid, that means lower pressure. Lower fluid, over here is lower fluid, means higher pressure. Higher fluid, it's over here on the right, is higher fluid. That means lower pressure. And all these variations of pressure with speed of fluid and height of fluid are embodied, encoded in this equation here, Bernoulli's equation. You see the pressure on the left and right, P1 and P2. You see the speed of the fluid on the left and right, V1, V2. And you see the height of the pipe or the fluid on the left and right, Y1, Y2. And this equation this kind of encodes, embodies that relationship between those three things, pressure, speed, height. Okay, I wanna work a example of, of Bernoulli's equation and the relationship between pressure and speed. And um, that, that'll be the last topic for today. Now, um, I'm showing you here uh, something that's quite interesting and, and illustrates this relation, again, illustrates this relationship between speed and pressure. So this is a tank of water. Here it is. <clears throat> 
tall, narrow, thin tank of water. And here's the water up to this point. And there's three spigots on this tank of water. There's this one upstairs here, this one in the middle here, and this one downstairs here. And they've been opened. And so the water is flowing out of these spigots. Now you see an interesting thing. If you look at the look at the motion of the water, the water is like projectile motion. It actually is just like projectile motion. And we've already described that projectile motion in earlier classes. Notice the curvature of the water from the top spigot, the intermediate spigot, and the lower spigot. So the water coming out of the top spigot curls down more rapidly. The water from the bottom spigot curls down much less rapidly. Now, if you just rolled rolled an object, a ball off a desk, say, it would just fall straight vertically down if you rolled it off slowly. If you fired a bullet from a gun at high speed, it would travel almost horizontally away from the gun. And so what you're seeing here is that upstairs here, the water must be emerging with a relatively low speed because it's quickly curving down towards the ground. The water on the bottom here, that must be emerging with a relatively high speed because it's, more, it's acting more like a bullet from a gun in traveling almost horizontally initially. So from, from the flow of the water out of those three pipes and observing and remembering what we know about projectile motion, we're able to infer, right, that this speed of the water upstairs here is small. This speed downstairs is, is high. And so that's what I tried to summarize here. The speed upstairs, V1, is smaller than the speed V2, the one in the middle, which is smaller than the highest speed downstairs here, V3. From Bernoulli's principle, right, that means that if we go from just outside the spigot to in the tank of water, where the, the water is essentially stationary here, the pressure must be highest at the bottom because the speed is largest at the bottom. The pressure must be lowest at the top because the speed is slowest at the top. So this is illustrating again the relationship in Bernoulli's principle between pressure and velocity. We're seeing low speed here upstairs, we're seeing high speed here downstairs. That means we're inferring lower pressure upstairs here and higher pressure downstairs here. So let me just, based on that understanding of the water flowing out of the spigots, um, answer this, this question in the last uh, few minutes here. So we've got a water jet and it squirts from a hole in the bottom of the tank. And that's shown in this little picture here. It's shown in this little sketch here. Here's the water jet. And we're told that uh, when the water comes out of the tank, it travels a vertical distance downwards, that's one meter, and it travels a horizontal distance, left, right, that's 0.6 meters. And we've got to take that information and we've got to figure out the height of the water in the tank. So that's an interesting question, right? We're like, um, we're at the fountain, we see how far the water travels from the fountain, and uh, we're going to figure out the height of water in the fountain. I mean, at the beginning of the course, I would have thought this was an impossibly difficult problem. But now with our understanding of projectile motions, and our understanding of fluids and pressure, we're actually going to be able to solve this. Okay, so there's two steps to solving this problem. The first step is actually to apply something from our early classes. Remember those early classes on falling bodies, projectile motion? Well, this fluid is like a, a falling body, like a projectile motion. And so we're gonna apply projectile motion to 
uh, understanding of the fluid emerging from the hole and striking the ground. Specifically, what we're going to try and do is calculate the speed. Oh, sorry. The speed of the fluid as it exits this hole. And I'm going to call that uh, V naught. I'm going to call it V naught X because it's traveling horizontally initially. And the way we're going to do it is from projectile motion. We know that the fluid travels downwards one meter and horizontally 0.6 of a meter. And with that information and the acceleration of gravity, we can actually figure out this initial speed of the fluid. Let's see how we did this. We've done, actually done this problem in the past when we thought about projectiles. So firstly, I'm going to find the time that it takes to fall. And I'm, to find the time, I'm going to use the, the vertical motion. And I'm going to use this equation of vertical motion uh, where I know that the initial vertical velocity is zero. So this piece goes away. And this is a relationship between the time distance, the time taken and the distance fallen. If I rearrange it, I get this little equation here, that the time taken to fall is the square root of two times the distance fallen by, divided by the acceleration of gravity. And if you fill in the numbers, you get half a second or 0.45 seconds. Now I know how long it takes to fall. I can find the speed that it was traveling at, the horizontal speed it was tra traveling at, uh, when it, when it left the, um, the spigot. So let's do that. There I need to describe the horizontal motion. So here's the equation describing the horizontal motion. In this case, there's no acceleration, so the second piece goes away. And it tells me that the speed that it's initially traveling at, v naught x, what I want is related to the distance traveled. I just got to rearrange that equation for the initial speed and fill in the distance traveled horizontally and the time taken, I get 1.33 meters per second. So that was like uh, only one slide to go. So sorry, I'm overrunning, but let me just finish off this last slide. We now know the initial velocity. So take a look at this picture now. At this point, as the water comes out the spigot, the initial velocity is 1.33 meters per second. And the pressure, it's atmospheric pressure. At this point, I labeled it two, one. This is where the fluid is inside the tank. So the speed is zero here. And the pressure, the pressure is atmospheric pressure plus this piece, which is determined by the height of the fluid above this location where this, the spigot is, or the hole is located. Bernoulli's principle tells me that the pressure inside and outside are related to the speed inside and outside by this equation here. If you look at this equation, um, we know that this speed is zero. And so if we, and we, if we rearrange this equation, we can, and write this pressure P1 as atmospheric pressure plus this piece involving the height, we've got a little equation here that we can solve for the height in terms of the, um, in terms of the speed, this speed here, V2, what I call V2. And so if I rearrange that equation, the, the atmospheric pressures cancel out. I get this equation for the height of the fluid. And if we solve for the height of the fluid, I get 0 0.09 meters. And so that's an application of Bernoulli's equation. Look, I'm sorry I've overrun by a couple of minutes. I shouldn't do that. I know that's naughty. Um, uh, our class today was all about hydrodynamics, uh, hydrostatics, why boats float, why ships, uh, why boats float, uh, why planes fly, and, and um, Next class, we're going to move on to uh, the very last topic in this mod module, which is periodic motion.